Welcome to Stillwater's Church. Those of you joining us online today, welcome to you as well. I I like that song. Did you know that rain in the Bible is a picture of the blessings of God? And so this song is that we are claiming God's blessings in our life. Now, how do you get the blessings of God? The Bible's pretty clear when you obey Him, when you follow Him, when you believe in Him, God blesses your life. And so that is a beautiful picture, I believe, of what God wants to do in our lives. Well, today, I want to talk to you about warnings about money. Warnings about money. I heard this said one time, and I think it's a true statement. Money is a wonderful tool, but it's a terrible master. It's a wonderful tool, but a terrible master. I'm going to begin reading in the book of 1 Timothy Chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 17 to 19, and this is the Apostle Paul, and he writes, giving us a warning, okay? And here's what he said, as for the rich in this present age, now who are the rich? We are. We are. Did you know, don't you get this, if you make the average household income here in this region? Did you know you're in the top 5% of wage earners in the world? Now, the truth is, we don't feel rich. Sometimes we uh, don't manage our money like the rich do. We get into trouble. We get stressed over money. But God says, for those of you that I've blessed, which is all of us, okay, and uh, I would argue that every Christian, this is a challenge too because we're all blessed, no matter what your financial level is. He says, as for the rich in this present age, I charge you, I charge them not to be haughty, not to be haughty, nor to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches. Boy, aren't riches uncertain? I mean, here today, gone tomorrow. It says in the book of Proverbs that some people put their money in a bag like it's got a hole in it. And it just disappears. You ever wondered where your money went? You ever get to the end of the month and you got more month left and no paycheck left? The fact is we've all been there. He says, don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So it's all God's. It's all from him. And we are to... See him as the one that is our provider. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves as a good foundation for the future. Now, I want you to get how that's written. He says, you want a good foundation for the future? First of all, we need a foundation, do we not? Financially as well as spiritually, okay? If you are a little bit older than uh, just getting out of college or whatever, and you've been uh, looking to set up a financial future, what do you do? You develop a foundation. You begin to save. You begin to live by budget. You begin not to spend all your money on parties on the weekends. You begin to plan, right? Um, If you're going to retire, you have to have a foundation. So you got to build a foundation but it's also for the future. Why? Because hopefully you don't run out of money before you run out of days to live, right? So he's saying you got to set up a good foundation, but it's not just financially, okay? He's challenging us to do that, but it's also setting up a spiritual foundation for the future. So it's interesting how he ties our management of money, our attitude toward money toward our spiritual foundation for the future. He says, be rich in good works, be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And what he's saying there is this. There are some things that are more important than others. There are some things you got to prepare for. There are some things you got to do if you want to make an impact with your life. Now, we all want to make an impact. We all want to take care of our family. 
We all want to take care of our retirement. We all want to take care of our future, okay? But there are some things that he says that are more important than others. He's not diminishing the importance of planning financially. In fact, he is the opposite of that. He's saying if you handle your money right, you're going to please God more. Now, I want you to let that sink in for a moment. Now, the truth is, uh, money is just simply a tool. It's neither good or bad. We hear people say a lot that money is the root of all evil. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. It's the inordinate affection and attention that we give to it that becomes the root of evil in our life. It will lead us to do things that we normally would not do. So as I see it in this Uh, These three verses that we read today, there are three warnings. And I want to just lay it out for us today. Three warnings that God uh, has us to deal with our attitude about money, how we manage money, how we look at money, and what does God say about it. Well, first of all, the first warning is this. God warns us about significance. Significance. Say, what do you mean by that? Well, Our significance comes from God, not from our money. Did you know that throughout Scripture and throughout the history of the world, people have placed great significance on money and possessions? In fact, uh, you remember when God said, Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said this. He said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or will be devoted to the one and despise the other, you cannot serve both God and money. Now, what an odd thing to say. Doesn't that seem like a very strange way of putting things? You can't serve God and money. Why would Jesus say that? Well, the, the actual word there is the word mammon. The word mammon was the Babylonian, the name of a Babylonian God for money. Now, let me tell you what this Babylonian God represented to people. He represented significance. He, he represented uh, provision. He represented uh, health and well-being, and I could just go down the list. The point is, God was very clear. Jesus was saying this. He said, you don't get your significance, your importance to God, your importance to life from your possessions. He said, you cannot serve both God and money. We have to make a choice. Am I going to get my significance from God or am I going to get it from my bank account? Am I going to get my significance from God or am I going to get it from my possessions? Now, it is very easy for us to try to get our significance from our paycheck, the amount of money that we have. Why? Because that's the way this world is set up, right? The more you have, the more important you are. At least that's the way a lot of people think. You got a lot of money, you're important. You don't have much money, you're not very important. Well, that's not true in God's economy. It's not true in the eyes of God, and it should not be true in the eyes of a believer. And so our significance does not come from the amount of money that we have. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 12, 15. He said, and beware Guard against every kind of greed. And listen to this next sentence. Life is not measured by how much you own. It's not measured by the size of your house or the model and make of your car or the size of your bank account. Your importance to God is far greater than the amount of money that you have in the bank. You are greatly important to God. You're more important to God. In fact, you're so important to God that he gave the best that he had for you. He gave Jesus Christ, okay? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's how much you can see that you are significant to God. You can tell the significance of something and the value of something by what someone is willing to pay for it, okay? Now, there are some people that have um, things that they treasure, okay? I I know people that they treasure collectibles. Um, 
my brother-in-law for many years collected baseball cards and football cards and things of that nature. In fact, he, he got a collection so big that it was really quite valuable. But you knew that a card was valuable to him if he was willing to pay a lot of money for it. And in the same way, you and I know how much something uh, is valuable to us by what we're willing to pay for it. God says that you are so valuable that your significance does not come from your paycheck. And, And God warns us about this because the truth is we all have a tendency to be caught in that web. The idea that our significance, our importance is only based on our net worth. In fact, a lot of people, they base their self-worth on their net worth. And we see this often when people have financial problems or a crisis or the stock market crashes. You remember a few years ago, big stock market crash, and there were just countless numbers of people that committed suicide over some zeros on a piece of paper. Why is that? Well, was there value in that money? Well, of course, there's some value in it, but they put their value, they equated it with how much money they had in the bank. And what God warns us about is that our significance comes from him. Our significance comes from our relationship with God, not from your money. This is a big warning. Now, let me just give you some things that characterize the heart of a person that gets their value from money, their significance from money rather than from God. One is pride. When I have a lot of money, I'm really tempted to be filled with pride. What what does that pride come from? Well, sometimes I think I'm the one that's the source. Now, you should be willing to work hard. You should be willing to be creative. You should use the talent that God has given you. But the fact is, understand, everything comes from God. You say, well, no, man, I worked. I had a plan. Well, who do you think let you be born with the mental capacity to be able to do that? Who do you think allowed you to be born in a place where you have the opportunity to do that? There are people that are just as smart as you, just as talented as you, that were born in parts of the world that they had no opportunity, and therefore, we often get filled with pride because we think that we're the source. But God says you're not the source, that he is the source, and that if we're not careful, we'll be filled with pride. You ever notice how easy that creeps into our lives? You know, you get a new house, and then all of a sudden, those people, those relatives, those family members that don't live in as nice a house as you do, you begin to look down on them, you know? Um, Man, it's easy. It's easy to be filled with pride. Uh, There are times in my life, there were times in my life, that I sometimes got filled with pride by the kind of car that I drove. And uh, I've had some nice cars in my life, but I'm, I'm not a car person per se. But thankfully, God broke that hold in my life. I, the car that I've got, I've been driving for 16 years. And let me just tell you this, and I'm not doing this to try to point out anything about me. It is glorious not to have a car payment for a long, long time. You say, well, what, what's the deal? Well, when I was a younger man, Every, before I had a car paid off, because I didn't, I had paid for uh, cars in cash before, but I got into this habit of having a car payment, and before I got it paid off, I had to trade it in for another. You ever get upside down in a car? There was a time in my life that I was upside down in car notes, okay? And um, I was just like so filled with, I had to have something new, okay? Now, please don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with having a new car. Just because you get a new car, I'm not saying you're filled with pride, okay? What I'm saying is that I was filled with pride because not that, and I wasn't saying, God, I'm the source. I wasn't denying that God is the provider or anything. I'm just saying that there was a time in my life when I really began to think that the kind of car that I drove was super, super important. And once again, nothing wrong with having a new car. I hope all of you get a new one. But let me just tell you, 
doesn't really matter what kind of car you drive. As long as it gets you from point A to point B, I guess, you know, if you've got one of those cars that won't make it across the parking lot without breaking down, maybe you should get another car, all right? So, but pride will um, be characteristic of us when we have this attitude. Another characteristic is a poverty mentality. He said, what is a poverty mentality? It's the idea that there's never enough. And what people that have a poverty mentality do, they cannot be generous. Why? Because they're afraid. You know, that has nothing to do with the amount of money you have in the bank either. I've known people that were extremely wealthy. And by extremely wealthy, I don't mean just like that they had, you know, a couple thousand dollars in the bank. I'm talking about multi, multi-millionaires. People that would never have to work again the, the, the rest of their life. I'm talking about people that had so much money that it was mind-boggling. And yet, I've known people like that that had a poverty mentality. You say, how can a person have a poverty mentality when they got so much money in the bank? Because they see God not as the provider, but they see God as the one that just kind of allows them, and they don't trust God for their provision. And I, I heard a, a pastor tell about a couple in his church. Now, I've never met these people, but I heard a pastor tell about a couple in his church that were billionaires with a B. Billionaires. And yet, he, in talking with them, listening to them, they did not have enough. They weren't greedy. It wasn't that they were selfish. It's just that they just didn't think there would be enough. That one day, it might all go away. And you get your significance from your money when you live that way, and you, it leads to a poverty mentality. The idea that there will never be enough. On the other hand, I've seen people that were poor by our standards that love God, and they didn't stress out over money, and they put God first, and they were generous, and they didn't live in stress at all. M amazing, isn't it? When you see God as a source, it changes things. It gives you significance. Uh, people that have uh, an idea that their source or that their significance comes from money, um, they believe that they are uh, the owner rather than the steward. When you think you're the owner, kind of hard to let go of it. Anybody ever do this? Uh, when you go out, and you know somebody else is paying for the meal, and you're just like, ooh, yeah, I'm going to get whatever it is that you always want. But when you're paying for it, you're like, I'm not spending that money. Anybody ever done that? Okay. Or if you ever done this? You get a $100 bill. How many ever had a $100 bill in your wallet? Raise your hand. You've had a $100 bill? I have found that if I get a $100 bill, it is really hard for me to break it, you know? I won't buy lunch. I won't buy a Coke. I won't buy anything. Why? Because I want to break that $100 bill, right? You know what I'm talking about? And maybe that's a good thing. But uh, when you see God as the owner and you as the steward, it changes your mentality about significance. Um, when you let money or possessions or position dominate you or define you, then you're getting your significance from the wrong place, the wrong source. So God gives us a warning about significance. Here's the second warning he gives us. It's about security. We are to be warned, we're to be aware that our security does not come from our money. Now, once again, a lot of times people are like, well, money can't buy happiness, and that's true, but poverty can't buy happiness either, okay? So the point is, it's not about how much money you have. It's about your attitude toward it and how in your relationship with God that you deal with it. So God, listen to his warning. He said, don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. You ever notice that easy come, easy go? You ever, you ever notice that Wealth can be truly, truly uncertain. 
I mean, the fact is, if you put your hope in that, you're always going to be in trouble mentally, emotionally. You're going to be stressed out all the time. Listen to Ecclesiastes 5.10. Whoever loves money will never be satisfied with money. Whoever loves wealth will never be satisfied with more income. You see, if I put my hope in money, then my hope is misplaced. And God warns about it. Why does he warn this? Because this is our tendency. We have to guard against this. What I've noticed in my own life is that the more God blesses me with, the more I have to guard against this attitude. When Kim and I first got married, we were broke as convicts, okay? I mean, we didn't have much money at all. In fact, our idea of a big, big, fun night out was, this is back in the day when uh, videotapes, VHS tapes, were they still have blockbuster video. We'd go rent a couple movies, and we'd have a night in. That was our big night out, you know? I guess it didn't dawn on us the irony of that, okay? But you know what I discovered? Is that the older I got, and the more income that I had, and the more... Uh, assets that I obtained and the more uh, possessions that I owned, that it was not as simple. When I was a young man, when Kim and I were first married, we didn't worry about much. We weren't stressed about much. We had a great time. And if we had $5 to get some pizza, then so be it. If we didn't have $5 to get some pizza, we didn't care. Okay? We weren't stressed. We weren't wringing our hands just thinking, oh, no, what's going to happen tomorrow? We didn't worry about that. You know why? Well, we saw our security is coming from God, okay? But the fact is, we didn't have a lot to worry about, not a lot to stress over. What happens when we put our hopes and our dreams and our faith in the uncertainty of riches rather than God? Let me tell you, we worry, we doubt, you ever doubt God as you get older, as you have more bills, as you have more responsibilities, and then all of a sudden you start getting the tight stomach, you, get, you can't sleep at night because you're worried about, well, how am I going to pay for the kids' braces, or how am I going to uh, go to the doctor or the dentist, or how am I going to pay for the car? I, I had a flat tire. We can't afford to have a flat tire right now, and the truth is, when we get our security from money rather than from God, then we begin to worry. We begin to doubt. God, are you going to come through? God, are you really there? God, are you going to keep your promises? We begin to live by fear. Man, that is no way to live. We fear what the stock market is going to do. We fear losing our job. We fear so many things that, as one preacher used to say, you have coffee, cigarettes, and fingernails every morning for breakfast. You're so nervous, all right? And, and, you know, we begin to live by fear rather than getting our security from God. We begin to have the wrong attitude. Easy to get the wrong attitude, isn't it? You get a little financial bump in the road, all of a sudden you're mad at God. Uh, you have a little financial challenge. All of a sudden, oh, God's not coming through. I've been given all these years, and God, I, my refrigerator broke down. Can I tell you that sometimes God's not angry at you, but sometimes refrigerators just break down, all right? Now, I know that's hard to, to, to believe, okay? But sometimes God's not mad at you because your tires wore out, Okay? God, think of it the other way. God has protected you for a long time. In fact, so long that your tires wore out and you're still alive. Thank God for protecting you. We, we get all stressed and worried over money when we get our security from money. Isn't it weird that the more we get in the bank, the more income that we have, often the stress and the worry increases. It doesn't lessen. Now, once again, I'm not suggesting that if you're so broke that you're not sure where your baby's next meal is going to come from. I'm not suggesting that that's a good place to be. But I do believe that God will care for everyone who trusts in him. 
and God will protect everyone who trusts in him. Now, maybe you won't be the next Jeff Bezos. Maybe you will. But likely not, okay? But when we begin to see God as our source, not the economy, not our job, not our bank account, then we can begin to see the stress relieve us uh, or leave us. Stress, greed. You ever notice that how sometimes... Now, just because a person has a lot of money doesn't mean they're greedy. I know a lot of people think, well, that person, they're greedy. Look how much money they got, and they're still making more. Well, if you've got the right attitude about money, it's a tool. It is nothing more than a tool. And when you put it in the hands of God... God blesses you. I mean, let me give you an example from my own life. Um, when I was a kid, I had a, um, had a friend, and his name was Randy Kale, K-A-L-E, Randy Kale. And his father was a chiropractor. He was a doctor, and he um, was a very good, godly man. He, he and my parents were very good friends. He and his wife and my parents were good friends. We'd spend time in each other's houses. I'd go play at Randy's house. Randy would come play at my house. We were just little kids. And uh, like I said, his dad was one of them, and I didn't know it at the time, but one of the most generous people I've ever met. Uh, He determined when he started his business, he started his business, I guess, probably in the late 60s, early 70s, his chiropractic business. He determined that what he was going to do was that he was not going to tithe off of his uh, net as a business, he was going to tithe off the gross. You know what I mean when I say that? So in other words, before he paid his power bill, before he paid his employees, before he paid for the building, before he paid for any of the equipment, he said, God, I'm going to trust you so much, and I believe this is what you've called me to do. I'm going to write 10% off the top of every dime that comes through my business. Now, you might think, well, that's ridiculous, and it is. I mean, you might think, you can't make any money doing that, and you can't. You might think, you'll go broke doing that, and you will, unless you're trusting in God, okay? Because God's financial math doesn't always make sense. And here's what I know. He became one of the wealthiest people I've ever known in my life. And he became so famous, you may have heard of Life University here in the metro area of Atlanta. He was a significant part. In fact, there was a whole department where they studied the techniques that Dr. Michael Kale invented. Now, this is not about whether you like chiropractic or not, okay? The point is this. Here was a man that he did not get his security from the amount of money that was in his bank. He got his security from God. And this man gave millions and millions and millions of dollars to the cause of Christ. And God used him significantly because he didn't get his security for money. That's one of God's warnings. He says, be careful. Don't get your significance or your security from your money. We tend to compare We tend to have no contentment when we get our security from money. You ever notice that when you start living that way, you do not have contentment often. Let me give you a little test. How many of you have ever seen a teenage boy, maybe 16 to 18 years old, and he's driving a brand new very, very expensive car. And you see him, and the thought that comes to your mind is this. What a hardworking, industrious young man that at 18 years old, he can afford this car. No, that's not what you think. You think, spoiled little brat, rich kid, right? And that may not be true at all. But the truth is, we start comparing. Well, I don't have a car like that. So what? Majority of people in the world don't have a car. In fact, if you own a car, you're in the top 
50% of the wealthiest people in the world. Maybe we should not be so quick to judge. Maybe we should be very quick to heed the warning of God about money that we don't get our security. We don't get our significance from it. And then here's the last thought. God warns us about stewardship. God says we're to steward what he gives us, whether it's a little or a lot. Let me finish reading that sentence or rereading those verses. He says, put your attention on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Did you get that? He richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Uh, they are to do good, to be good in good work, or to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, uh, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold uh, that they may take hold of that which is truly life. I'm gonna get new glasses. I can't see this very well, so I'm stumbling. So stewardship is managing what God owns in a way that pleases Him. So what is God's given purpose for our money? Well, a few things. Uh, one is to provide our needs. That should be pretty obvious. He's given us everything to enjoy. When you begin to understand that everything is from God, I heard a term years ago called Christian hedonism. Christian hedonism. And, and don't worry, it's not, a, it's not a bad term. It's the idea of a person that is completely reliant on God, so much so that they actually enjoy the blessings that God puts on their life. Now, let me ask you a question. When's the last time you enjoyed what God blessed you with? When's the last time that you truly saw him as the source and you didn't feel guilty about it? Uh, years ago, um, and for those of you who have been around me a long time, you know that I began, my parents taught me to tithe when I was 10 years old. And to the glory of God, I do not owe God one single penny from any birthday money, gift money, income that I earned from the time I was 10 years old to today. I put God first in every instance in my life. I've even tried to practice what Dr. Michael Kale practiced, that in the businesses and the things that I've done, that I put God first before I pay a bill, before I do anything. And God has blessed me so much. It's just been amazing how much he has blessed me for that. But, you know, uh, God blesses us to provide our needs, okay, for us to enjoy it, to give him glory. Um, I, like I was saying years ago, I would get something that was nice or maybe someone blessed me or maybe they saw something that I had and people would say stuff like this, must be nice. <laughs> you ever heard somebody say that before? And the implication in that is that, you know, well, you don't really deserve that. Uh, you know, I don't have that. And uh, man, maybe you did something illegal or selfish or greedy or whatever, right? That, that's the implication. And there were so many times that when people would say something like that to me because I was so sensitive about making sure that I was above board and honest about everything that I would just go into this explanation well, you know, a person gave me this, or, you know, I got this on sale, or whatever. You know, God convicted me of that. You say, why? Because it didn't come from a sale. It came from God. And I started, when people would say, must be nice, I'd start saying, sure is. <laughs> you know why? Because he provides everything for us to enjoy. Okay? Whenever you begin to understand that it's all from God, that everything in our life is given to us to reflect glory back to him, then you can stop feeling the need to explain everything away, you know? And look, uh, I feel like the Lord wants me to share this. Um, I had somebody give my wife and me two Rolexes a number of years ago. And I, I had a, a Rolex Submariner. 
loved, loved, loved that watch, okay? Maybe I loved it a little too much, okay? My wife in the same way, and don't worry, we don't have them anymore. We wore them for a while, and we gave them away to these missions causes, okay? And, um, you know, the fact is, uh, I was very, very guilt-driven. The fact that I had a Rolex watch, and I was like, you know, would Jesus wear a Rolex on his television show? Okay, you know, I don't know. That's a song reference, by the way, in case you get missed it. Ray Stevens, anybody? All right, so. Um, but the point is this. No matter what God blesses you with, it's a blessing. Do you realize that every one of us, go back 200 years, do you know that we're extremely wealthy compared to the people of 200 years ago? We're blessed. We've got vehicles to drive. Most of us have air-conditioned homes. We have heat in our house. Uh, we have food to eat. And, and I could go on. My point is this. Um, no matter what God blesses you with, give him glory and honor. Rejoice and understand that it is all from him, that he provides for our needs. Well, let me, let me finish this and wrap this up. Um, 1 Timothy 5, 8, but those who won't care for their relatives, especially those of their own household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. So God provides for you, so you provide for your family, okay? Um, what does the Bible say about this? Well, there's no limit on how much you can earn as long as your attitude's right and as long as you don't worship it. But God says, earn it honestly. Listen to Proverbs 13, 11, wealth from get rich quick schemes, and that's another way of saying dishonest money. Wealth from dishonest money quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. And so God wants us to manage what he gives us, okay? Um, so we are to manage it carefully. Proverbs 21.5, plan carefully and you'll have plenty. If you act too quickly, you will never have enough. For those of you that are young, and you're getting started, let me just encourage you, live by budget. I know they're difficult. I don't like them myself. I live by it because I don't want to get to the end of my month and be shocked and surprised at where my money went, okay? And when we manage what God gives to us carefully, carefully, we'll have more to do what we want for the kingdom of God, for retirement, for the future, and I realize I've got a, a, a large age span here. Some of you are getting started, and some of you are in retirement now. And for those of you in retirement, you, you're like, you know, I don't need to hear this because I've already done all that. Well, the point is, we don't trust in the retirement fund. We trust in God. That's the point, okay? That's the point. What do we do? We are to manage it carefully. We're to earn it honestly. Work hard. By the way, for those of you that may be younger generations, and maybe you wonder, what does the Bible say about earning money? Here's what it says. Work hard. Be honest. And, you know, as long as you're not letting it dominate you, you say, well, I spend, you know, shouldn't we spend more time at church than we do working? No. That's not what the Bible shows or teaches. Do you know that God gave work to Adam and Eve before sin ever entered into the world? Now, what you should do is honor God with your work. You should worship God with your work. But you can't be here at the church 24-7, okay? Because I'm not going to be here 24-7. And, uh, I, you know, if you're here 24-7, I ain't going to be around, okay? The point is this. We're to honor God and then we're to celebrate the goodness of God. Ecclesiastes 5, 19, it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and the good health to enjoy it. To enjoy your work and accept your lot in life, this is indeed a gift from God. So enjoy what God gives you. Don't feel guilty. If you can afford a vacation, enjoy it. Don't be the person that goes on vacation and is like, oh my goodness, we can't get oysters with this meal because that's going to break the budget. Now, live by budget, I get that, okay? But in other words, enjoy. Enjoy what God has blessed you with. See God as the source. And then we're to fulfill our purpose and fund the kingdom of God. 
He said we're to do good, we're to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. You know what God's saying? That there are some things that are more important than others. And we, not, we must think about eternity. We must, we must, we must use our resources for the kingdom of God. Yes, we're to provide for our needs. And yes, we're to enjoy life. And yes, we're to not compare. We're not to be greedy. We're to be generous. I, yes, all that, that I've talked about. But the point is that we must also use our money to fulfill God's purpose for our lives and for the church in the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8, and I close with this. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly, or under compulsion. If you ever feel pressure from me to give, don't give. You say, oh my goodness, I can't believe a pastor would say that. Well, I'm not trying to pressure you. I want you to see the grace of God. I want you to see Jesus for who he is. And when you really begin to see him for who he is, giving is going to be the least of your problems. You're going to be generous. You know why? Because you see God for who he is as a generous provider. As the one who loves you, the one that has provided all things for your good and for his glory. He said, for God loves a cheerful giver. Cheerful giver. Now, I've always said that we want you to be cheerful givers. We'll take it from a grouch, but we want you to be cheerful, okay? (laughs) Now, God wants you to see that. Giving should be a direct result of your relationship with God. You know what I've never had to do? I don't think ever. I've never had to get on to a mother for not being generous with her child. I don't, I've never known of a father. Maybe there's been one or two. But I've never known a father that was selfish in dealing with his own children. He always wants to be generous. She always wants to give. She always wants to be a blessing. And you know, in the same way, that's the way our relationship with our Heavenly Father should be. And so when we see God for who He is, it says, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times. When I get my attitude right about money, That little three-letter word, A-L-L, you know what the Greek for that word is? All. (laughs) That's what it means. He's able to do it all. That we're always living in sufficiency. When? How often? At all times. At all times. And he says, so that you may abound in every good work. These principles are true for every stage of life, no matter where you are. And so my challenge to you today is that you receive these warnings from God about money. We don't get our security, our significance from money, but our stewardship, God warns us about that. He says, be careful to give him glory, to manage it according to his word, to be generous. And when you do, he says, you'll have All sufficiency in all things at all times. That pretty much covers it, doesn't it? Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us today to live with these warnings about money, not to put our hopes in it or our dreams in it. Not that you don't use it. Money is just simply a tool. But God, help us to honor you and glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.